This week on The Communicators, a discussion on the current state of the news media and its future with Tom Rosenstiel, the director of the Pew Research Center's Project for Excellence in Journalism. Tom Rosenstiel, how would you describe in a broad sense the state of the news media? Well, the news media is being buffeted by two things. First is obviously the technological changes that uh, are really destroying the financial foundation of the press. And the second is the recession, which is probably doubling the problems uh, in the last year uh, and making the ability of the press to sort through the structural technological problems more difficult. Uh, fundamentally, the problem facing the news business is not an audience problem. If you take the total audience of newspapers, it's really not declining, and for many newspapers, it's growing. The problem is a revenue problem. It turns out that the Internet is not a very good delivery system for advertising for a couple of reasons. The first one is that many advertisers no longer need the news to reach their audience. They can have their own websites. If you want to find out what Best Buy has on sale, you don't have to wait for the Sunday paper and that in glossy insert to tell you mm -hmm. the details. You can go on their website at 3 in the morning. Uh, so there's been a decoupling of advertising from news. And the second is that the interface that users have with information online is different. You are hunting for what you're looking for. Uh, and so after you do that Google search, and you finally find the link and you click on it and the story that you're looking for pops up, the ad that pops up in front of it is an intrusion rather than a welcome piece of content the way that it tends to be, according to surveys, uh, in print and in television where people find the ads entertaining uh, and even interesting. So yearly, the, the Pew Center takes a look at these kind of issues. If those two things are at the, the top of the list, how does that affect the whole, as far as the state of journalism is concerned? Well, journalism was, in a sense, in a race against the clock. That's been going, and that race has been going on for the last decade. And the race is, can they use the shrinking revenues of their old platforms to figure out a way to, uh, use, to invent a new revenue model in the platform that's growing online? Uh, it's increasingly clear that advertising, which is the happy accident that has financed journalism mm -hmm. for the last hundred years is not going to be able to finance journalism as we know it uh, in the new century. So can they come up with the money that they're making, can they experiment and come up with other new revenue models? And the question really facing journalism going into to the last year was, well, you know, it's going to take some years to sort this out, but we're fine. We're, we've got a lot of revenue and, and that revenue is drawing down, but we can, you know, that's time on the clock. Uh, well, what happened in 2008, and it's happening again in 2009, is time is being wiped off the clock. Uh, as revenues shrink more quickly, and as the audience migration to the web accelerates, uh, there's less time to sort that out. And that's the other thing that I think people don't understand, is that there was a, a, an acceleration in the migration to the web in the last year. It's not as noticeable, but uh, to take the top 50 news websites, for instance, um, which includes most of the major newspapers, uh, and almost all of these websites are traditional news outlets, mm -hmm. uh, their audience, their traffic, increased by 27% in 2008. After, that's about double what it had been uh, the year before, about triple what it was two years ago. People are becoming more accustomed to using the web as their daily and and regular means of gathering information. And does that show that people are still, when they go to these new sources online, they're going to trusted sources? They tr and, and is trust a big issue still as far as where people get their news online? Yeah. A lot of people thought five or six years ago that what would happen with the Internet was people would abandon journalism. They would say, you know, I'd rather get it from, an, from a, a, a citizen or a news source that's more informal, uh, blogs, uh, alternative websites. This was the growing thing. Uh, and that what would happen to journalism is it would lose its audience. Well, that's not really what's happened. Uh, the biggest websites are getting bigger, and those big websites are all traditional media. The old values of journalism 
continue to have a pull on the audience. They continue to have value with, with, with audiences. And those websites, in many ways, are doing even better than they were doing in, 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 in legacy media. To give you an idea, the top 10 newspapers in print uh, attract 19% of um, uh, all print circulation. Online, the top 10 newspaper websites attract 29% of all newspaper website uh, circulation or, or, or website traffic. Um, uh, the, have you heard of the concept of the long tail? The no. long tail is the idea that online uh, that a, a million little websites would actually uh, create a mass market that was bigger than the old mass market and that s a, a collection of small things would be bigger than the old media uh, and the oligarchies would fall away. Well, it turns out, at least at this point, that that's not what's happening. What's happening is the, the uh, big end of the tail, the old media, are getting bigger. Hmm. That long end of the tail is also getting bigger, although not nearly as big, and, not, and it's not growing as, as much as the, as the front end of the tail. But what's really withering is the middle, the big city metro newspapers, uh, the, the medium-sized uh, outlets that cannot compete uh, uh, at the national level against the biggest sites, but also can't be uh, local or micro enough against the, the long end of the tail. Uh, it's not what people expected, uh, but it, it has a, a big potential impact on, on our civic life. And part of the report you talk about that when it came to looking at technology to deliver this content, that journalism or journalists or companies were afraid uh, of using this technology. Why is that? Well, people think, I mean, it, why is that? It's the same reason that, uh, you know, railroad companies didn't see themselves as being in the transportation business. They saw themselves as in the railroad business or the buggy companies or all the, uh, all the other, uh, you know, older businesses that went through a period of, of disorientation like this. Uh, the, the news business has lost, to give you an example, half of all of its cla classified revenue. Mm. Uh, uh, where did it go? Well, people think, oh, well, it went to Craigslist. Not really. It, it went to, a lot of it went to Monster.com for jobs. Why? Because Monster.com created a superior delivery system online for finding uh, jobs than you could get in a newspaper. And the newspaper industry could have created Monster.com, could have said, we're in the classified business, uh, and the web is potentially a superior way of delivering that. Uh, well, we're going to take that audience, move it over here, and we'll figure out a way to finance that down the road. They didn't do that. The same thing with real estate uh, classifieds, which have also vanished uh, to a significant degree. Uh, the, the web was a way to take those three lines of, of sketchy uh, uh, rhetoric that was in a classified ad on, uh, uh, in the newspaper and make it a virtual tour of the house with all kinds of historical documents. Mm -hmm. You could learn everything you needed to virtually see the house. Uh, 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 the newspaper industry didn't, didn't, didn't do it. Realtor.com was created by the realty companies. Uh, so there was case after case, I can go through a litany of things, where the industry said, you know, our business, our revenue is in uh, print. We need to protect that. We need to build a, a wall around that uh, and, and compete against those things rather than recognize that that's really uh, the next generation of the same business. The report that, uh, that you can find online at the, the Pew Center, um, the Pew Project, it, it lists some highlights. And the one we've been talking about is the first one out the gate as far as the debate over funding models, as far as, uh, and you say, or at least the report does, it's focusing on the wrong remedies. Does that mean people or at least print guys are getting together and saying, okay, how do we fix this problem? And okay, let's go this way, and here's a smart idea. Where's the solution? Or if they're focused on wrong rem remedies, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, for the last couple of years, people in the, uh, in the news business have said, well, uh, online advertising just needs to grow more. Uh, our advertisers need to migrate alongside with our audience to the web. It's now clear that that's not going to happen for the reasons that we've already talked about and the problems with the Internet as a delivery system for ads. Uh, so. In late 2008, you began to see a, a serious discussion of, okay, we need a new revenue model. What can it be? And, and it really took two primary uh, focuses. One was micropayments. And there was an, uh, a cover story in Time Magazine uh, that said, maybe we can go back to the idea of having people pay for every article that mm -hmm. they read online 
uh, with an, a PayPal system or some invisible system where they won't actually have to put their credit card out each time. Wall Street Journal tried that and others, right? Yeah, the Wall Street Journal, it's not a pay, it's not a, it's not a, uh, necessarily a uh, pay by the article. If you subscribe to the journal online, you get as much as you want, but you can also just pay Got it. by article. Um, uh, the second big uh, focus of the discussion has been uh, whether nonprofits should take over the newspaper business because journalism is a public good. Uh, it's embedded in the First Amendment that uh, it's good for democracy that we have a free and robust press. Uh, uh, if the market can't sustain that, maybe uh, philanthropy will instead. There are two problems, I think, with, the, with the, where the discussion has been. Um, one is that micropayments has been tried uh, and it, uh, it didn't work uh, the first time around. Uh, and it creates disincentives for consumption. Uh, the more you use, the more you pay. Uh, uh, and the, the fundamental problem, the reason it didn't work is, people are not willing to pay for a, a, a commodity that's going to uh, rapidly lose value, a news story. Uh, for one news story, if they can get something similar, maybe not quite as good, but similar, free somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, the problem with a micropayment, pay for mine when another one is free, is people aren't, uh, haven't done it and, and there's no incentive to do it. The nonprofit discussion, while it has real value in targeted areas, can you improve science reporting, can you create a, a, a niche uh, science uh, website? Yes, probably, uh, because the amount of money to do that wouldn't be that huge. But to cover the entire city of New York, uh, the New York Times uh, uh, editorial budget is over $200 million a year. Mm. Well, that's an awful lot of phil philanthropic money. Right now, there's, uh, depending on the estimates, maybe 20 to $30 million in philanthropic financing of uh, news websites right now in, in the United States. So to imagine what it would take to ramp that up to supplant the Toledo Blade uh, or the Cincinnati uh, Post or the San Francisco uh, 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 Chronicle. The San Francisco Chronicle is losing fifty million dollars a year mm. in losses, not in operating costs, just in its losses. Um, I don't think that there's uh, uh, fifty million dollars in, in philanthropic money in, in, in the city of San Francisco that's willing to just lose that money, uh, but the actual losses might be uh, quite a bit more. Uh, the cost of the, just the cost of operating the news operations of newspapers alone. Uh, is probably over twenty billion dollars a year in the United States, um, and it might be higher depending on on how you do the numbers. And as the, even as we talk, uh, Senator Cardin from Maryland has introduced a bill that would take or at least give some newspapers regionally, locally, some nonprofit status. Right. I don't know if people are, are have taken or signed on to the bill yet. Yeah, it's very early. It just uh, uh, this week is when it emerged, and I think people really haven't had a time to 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 uh, figure out whether, I mean, even at the top of the news business, people are trying to figure out is, you know, what's the potential of nonprofit. Uh, but there are a lot of other ideas that have been out there that really have not been explored. Uh, we mentioned four in the report, and we're not advocating any of these, but we are advocating a more robust uh, discussion of revenue models. What's the most radical of the four? Well, they're all somewhat radical in the sense that they uh, are, are all different than what the news business is used to. One is, uh, is there a potential to, uh, for, the, for the news content producers to benefit from the one place where people do pay uh, uh, for the Internet, and that is at the Internet access point. We all pay a fee to get on the Internet. Mm -hmm. Is there some mechanism by which the news industry could uh, collaborate and say, we'd like to participate in that fee in some way? That's how cable works. You pay a subscription fee to... Uh, CNN and uh, Fox and the Golf Channel and the Food Channel in your cable bill. Um, there are different mechanisms potentially for doing that. Uh, much would have to be worked out. It might require regulatory relief. A lot of people think that the problems there are, 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 are too many and, and it's not practical. But uh, it, some work could be done to find and test whether there's potential there. Certainly I think that toll booth is the one toll booth that we have on the Internet if there is going to be fees for subscribers to, for a general media, uh, not specialized, uh, that that toll booth is, is, is certainly the first place to look. Uh, another option is to go to the aggregators. Uh, uh, again, this would require collaboration on the part of the news industry. It's a little bit easier, but you go to Google, 
You go to Yahoo, Google, of course, is number one. They control two-thirds of all search in the United States is through Google. Um, and Google has said things like, uh, we won't put search ads on Google News because that might be uh, taking the revenue away uh, from the news business. Well, they broke that promise. They now have search ads on Google News. Um, so the in news industry could get a lot more aggressive. Um, the other, another uh, potential area is to literally create retail mall space on news websites. Many, many local advertisers uh, to a website or potential advertisers are such small local businesses that they don't even have their own websites, let alone any e-commerce potential. Uh, the newspaper is a place that could uh, create that environment, engineer it, help these small businesses create websites, and, uh, and in the process, uh, create a more effective local search uh, through the newspaper. And then you not only find out about these retailers, but potentially even make transactions there. Mm -hmm. And the newspaper could get a point of purchase uh, fee as part of that transaction. This is an idea that was there early on in the internet, really hasn't been explored very well. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there are some other thoughts. But I think what, if there's any consensus here as the debate is beginning to grow over what, besides advertising, could finance journalism, that consensus point is that there probably isn't one solution. It would probably be, have to be many different uh, revenue sources cobbled together. Maybe nonprofit is part of that. Uh, maybe the nonprofit money could support parts of the newspaper that uh, particular parts of the community are interested in. That's where we've seen the nonprofit activity right now. It's in, let's do something for health news, let's do something for arts, let's do something for science, as opposed to, well, let's just do something for journalism. Uh, what some of the other findings from the report, while a lot of them dealt with the financing aspect, you uh, make the point, or at least the report does, that power when it comes to journalism is shifting to the individual journalist. Yeah, and uh, this is very interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, you've got, uh, uh, you can find as a consumer uh, people that you want to read, uh, and you may find them because you learn about them through search or through blogs. Uh, but certain writers uh, uh, come up, and uh, essentially what people are finding on the Internet is not necessarily a, 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 a website, but it's a particular piece of content. It's the individual story or the individual writer. Uh, that's who bloggers will link to. They'll, they may even have a standard link to all the work of a given writer. But also what we're seeing is that as writers and, and other journalists are leaving news organizations because of cutbacks, they're going out on their own, creating their own websites. You have, now have a site called Global Post, which is uh, uh, an idea that was developed at Harvard, where former foreign correspondents who work for newspapers are signing up, getting a, a monthly stipend to work for Global Post and providing foreign coverage uh, at, at that website, which can give them a base to see if they can then go out and become independent contractors for other news organizations. Uh, in much the same way that photographers uh, did a generation earlier where photographers lost their jobs at news magazines and became independent contractors and they sell their photos, uh, photo services then redistribute those photos to many different places and the money goes to the individual photographer. Um, we have seen that culture for magazine writers doing sort of long form analytical writing, but the idea that you'd be actually be gathering daily news accounts through freelance writers is really not a robust part of American journalism, and it may it's it's a it's an area that is clearly growing. We don't know what the viability of that is at this point, but it's clearly a shift that's occurring. Uh, take um, Andrew Sullivan as one example. Andrew Sullivan used to be the editor of the New Republic. He departed that magazine. He now has a website, AndrewSullivan.com. And people read Andrew Sullivan. They don't say, did you read The New Republic? They mm -hmm. say, did you read Andrew Sullivan today? He's a standalone, independent voice unto himself. Uh, as people turn to blogs and things like that for news, does the report or at least your, your research take into account concerns over if you have one person, you don't have a team of editors, they can put whatever they want out there. Clearly, it's opinion, but it's mingled with news. What does that do as the end result as far as the quality of journalism out there, especially online? Yeah, no, this is a major, uh, a major question, I think, going forward. The online culture uh, uh, has the potential for infinite depth, but it also has the potential for infinite speed. And right now, what we're seeing developing is more focus on that speed. 
uh, the whole culture of posting is uh, oriented towards sort of p put it out there first and verify uh, second, post-publication, if you will, uh, through a sorting out process as readers react to what's been posted. Um, that's our, a thorough paradigm shift in the way that journalism uh, works. Uh, as newspapers cut back on their resources, one of the areas they're clearly cutting back on is on copy editing and editing in general. At the Washington Post, one of our very best newspapers, they now have something called the two-touch rule, which means that an editor will touch a piece of copy only twice, which is fewer times than was, it was touched before because they can't afford the redundancy factors. And as you speed up the news gathering process, more mistakes are going to enter into it. Uh, it's almost a law of physics in journalism that uh, uh, more speed uh, equals less accuracy. Uh, you just have less time to check things. Um, and uh, there's, it's very difficult to pull things back. Once they're out there, they are out there, and they may speed around the globe uh, before anybody gets a chance to correct them. You have a background at the LA Times and Newsweek. What was your experience as a journalist when you had a piece go out as far as who looked at it and, and who vouched for it? Well, uh, typically, the, the longer the piece, the longer you worked on it, the, the longer it was edited. Uh, and so your most important pieces w tended to be uh, uh, edited for perhaps uh, uh, a couple of weeks before they would uh, go in the paper. Many different people would look at them, and if they were going to be a page one piece, they'd probably be looked at by quite senior editors. Uh, and, and there was, a, in a sense, a kind of uh, peer uh, review process that went on very quickly, but it went on. Uh, in much the same way that that process in an academic setting might take months where you have various experts look at things. Uh, now, um, uh, there is much less of that. Uh, and even at the news magazines, which are in, in, in really drastic uh, shape, uh, the fact-checking departments have been disassembled to a, a significant degree because they're an unaffordable uh, component of of the process. Uh, we talked a little bit about one of the points before going into this about the, the partnership of becoming a, a focus of news investment as, as it's concerned. Um, but I want to talk about number four as far as cable news. Generally, how does cable news fare in this environment? Well, if you were going to look at the various sectors of the, of, of the media in the last year, cable was the clearest winner. Um, uh, and uh, I think part of that is um, uh, story specific. Uh, cable focused itself in an almost Ahab-like manner around the election. Uh, we do a content analysis every day of, uh, of the media, uh, and uh, in the hours, and we do many hours a day of cable monitoring, um, two-thirds of the uh, content on cable was focused uh, on the election in 2008, at least during the time the election was still going on, roughly double any other media sector. Uh, and uh, cable, as a consequence of that largely, saw its audience uh, grow dramatically. Over through the course of the day, cable audiences were up 38% uh, in uh, 2008, and revenues were up by a third, 33%, uh, or actually not revenues, profits. Um, uh, uh, that goes away somewhat when the election goes away, and it's just, there's a sorting out process going on now as to whether that audience is going to remain. The total audience for cable, the universe of people who watched, grew quite a bit less, more like uh, single digits. Um, so what you had was uh, a, a core audience of people in cable watching more often. Uh, the rise of cable uh, in the last year, I mean, it's been growing for a while, but the rise in the last year, I think, has elevated some of the characteristics of cable into the rest of our political discourse. Uh, this singular fascination on one, subject, on one subject is part of it. Another part of it is the instant judgment. There's a kind of microscopic examination of the daily events. Uh, think of the first six weeks of the Obama presidency, the notion of a honeymoon in which you, there's a wait and see and give him time and see what's going on, uh, seems sort of ludicrous, almost an antiquated idea. He had a little bit of that during the, uh, uh, during the uh, transition period. Uh, I think that's a function of two things. First of all, the enormity of the problems that the president is facing and how quickly he's had to move, but also this sense that people, uh, that our television uh, uh, media 
is making instant judgments, that that's what it's in the business of doing. Uh, bloggers are in the, in the same business to a, a significant degree. And, and so bloggers I think, appearing on cable. <laughs> yes. Uh, a good deal of the amount of time on cable is actually not journalists talking. It's political activists, pundits, spin doctors, some of them labeled cable analysts, but really their day job is actually, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to be political uh, to be political actors. So I think we've had an acceleration in our political judgment as cable really becomes the primary television medium for political discourse, replacing network television. Factor in what we saw a couple of weeks ago on Comedy Central on the John Stewart show when he was taking Jim Cramer to task over statements that he'd made about you know, certain financial investments and things like that. Not only the content of what's being discussed, but the format it was being discussed in. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, you've got a cable comedy program taking on a cable financial network. I think it reflected a couple of things, and it was a fascinating kind of cultural moment. One is it reflected a sense that, uh, that cable uh, has a primacy here. I mean, the fact that, that uh, people would ascribe what happened on CNBC to being partly to blame uh, for uh, not recognizing and anticipating the financial meltdown you know, I think 10 years ago, people would have said, well, that's, that's CNBC. I mean, how, how significant is that? Even in the, in the dot-com bubble, there were some questions about it, but it wasn't really with the same ferocity as we're seeing now. And the other is uh, Stewart's role. This is not the first time he's taken on, uh, uh, in a very serious way, uh, things that he's seen on cable. Uh, he went on and attacked Crossfire. Uh, a couple of years ago uh, as uh, for, for sort of making sport of our political discourse. Uh, and Jonathan Klein, the president of CNN, uh, subsequently uh, said that he agreed with uh, uh, Stewart's criticism and uh, canceled uh, the Crossfire show. Uh, Stewart, whose program is comedy, but it's, it's satire with a kind of serious under, uh, uh, undercutting to it or un, you know, a subtext to it, Stewart is viewed by many of his viewers as, um, pr as something of a truth teller, something of a sense maker, of having a journalistic component to the show. Uh, I have one friend uh, who's an academic who teaches journalism who says that his students read the newspaper for facts and watch John Stewart for the truth. Hmm. Well, I think the same thing can be said of the viewers of Bill O'Reilly or Keith Olbermann. These folks who are more interpretive uh, in their programming, particularly some of the talk show hosts, create the impression for their audiences that they're sense makers, that they're putting the news in order. And in an environment where there's so much information, uh, there's a craving for that. Uh, when information is in wide supply, knowledge is harder to create because you have to sift through more stuff to create knowledge. And so the rise of some of the, of the talk show hosts is not just part of, it's not just a reflection of political polarization. It's also a reflection of a hunger that people have to help me make sense of this stuff. And whether it's Lou Dobbs or Jon Stewart or, um, uh, or Bill O'Reilly, uh, they're doing that. I, I think the CNBC folks, less so. They are very much incrementalists. They're touting stocks. Uh, that's really what that network is about, and, and Kramer is that, and I think Stewart basically attacked him uh, for doing only that. Uh, as far as we have a few minutes left, help us make sense of where we go from here. If the trends continue, not only financially, not only in content, but where do we see our, our, our sources of news in the next five to ten years, and what will they look like as far as how we get it? Well, what we have to remember, I think, first of all, is the ecosystem that we have now, newspapers are very important. Even if uh, most people, you know, only, even if only 43% of Americans say they read newspapers on a regular basis, the other 50 or 60% are getting a lot of information from newspapers because the AP and Reuters and other wires are lifting the things from around the country from those newspapers, distributing them uh, around, and the tell stories that those anchors are reading on television everywhere else, a lot of that comes from newspapers. So they have a, a larger role in the information ecosystem than we recognize. I think what you're going to see at newspapers is they're going to narrow their focus down to the things that they do best and they're going to borrow the rest. There'll be more collaboration and partnership. You'll read a lot more of the New York Times on your local newspaper's website and a lot of other sources. Newspapers are not going to just be their product. They're going to be uh, 
their product and everything else that they want to vouch for that they think will be helpful to you. Journalism, in a sense, is becoming more of a service. How can I help you? And, and less of a product, here's our stories. Um, so I think newspapers are going to focus on franchise things, but be collections of a lot of other things as well. I think uh, local television is in for a very difficult time. It's losing its audience uh, rapidly. Revenues, I'm told, are in the first quarter for most local TV stations were down 40%. This is going, going out of business time. Uh, uh, and, and while the headlines have focused on newspapers, actually I think local television may be in seri more serious uh, crisis. Uh, newspapers, the, the problems have actually been inflated a little bit. Uh, we're not seeing bankruptcy, we're not seeing newspapers go out of uh, existence uh, all over the place. We've seen two newspapers that were the second newspapers in, in, in a town go out of business. Uh, the newspaper industry overall is still profitable. The industry made $38 billion in revenues last year. What I think may happen uh, is you may see newspapers stop printing every day because they make half their revenue on Sunday and a good chunk of their revenue on Wednesdays when they do the food uh, sections and not all the other days are as profitable. So I, I think you may see newspapers begin to change, shrink, narrow, but, they, but print will remain a, a, a big part of it. Uh, and they will partner, and you'll see that newspaper copy popping up in a lot of other places. Tom Rosenstiel, Pew Project for Excellence in Journalism. Journalism.org is the website, and if you want to read the report for yourself, thanks for being on The Communicators. My pleasure.